All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us again today for the Cybersecurity Magazine podcast. This time, uh, I am joined by Jonathan Hiroshi Rossi from Saya University, as well as Anand Prasad, one of the editors of Cybersecurity Magazine. Hello, gentlemen. And our topic for today is going to be security awareness. Uh, what exactly it is, um, why it is so important, and what can be done to improve it. And Jonathan, we have you here as um, somebody who focuses professionally on, on security awareness, improving it in, in organizations, specifically in Japan, but also beyond that. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background, what brought you to this topic and why do you feel it's, it's so important? Well, thank you, Hans, for joining me in this conversation. I'm very passionate about security awareness. But before we get into that, so my name is Jonathan Rossi. I am a cybersecurity awareness evangelist at Sai University. I approach Saya University from the perspective as an entrepreneur. I'm an attorney by training. I spend a lot of time internationally in Japan, mostly. I travel through South America. And through all these different experiences, I looked at how culture impacts behavior. And so today, cybersecurity awareness is something that I look at from the vantage of a multilingual professional and how that impacts how behavior and employees in the context of enterprises or in just everyday families, how differences in culture and upbringing can impact how we interact with the network. Right. Thank you, Jonathan. I think, I think you mentioned something very valuable there, um, which is it, it's about behavior and analyzing and, and understanding why people behave in a, in a certain way when it comes to, to security, uh, not something that's, that's purely technical. And just wanted to to get your opinion on do you see a, a big difference in different markets that you operate in um does security awareness have to be approached differently in in one area than, than another oh yeah. yeah i would say significantly when you look at cybersecurity, just let's say just take the big picture of cybersecurity, and you go to the previous conference I've attended, you know, RSA, or we just had Black Hat last week. And in previous large forum cybersecurity conferences, you walk through a, a vendor hall. You'll have hundreds of different vendors selling products and services in cybersecurity. They're generally going to be more focused on technology. And, and then within that, you have cybersecurity awareness, a smaller segment of the cybersecurity industry. And then, on, and then within that segment of cybersecurity awareness, how many of those are non-English or American central? And so then the answer slowly, as you look through that, becomes close to like maybe less than a dozen, less than a half a dozen. And so when you look at the global population, over 7 billion people, how many don't actually speak English as their native language? How many operate professionally? How many engage in the world around them? through a language another, another than English. And so when you look at behavior and how you engage a, a group of people, uh, it is, doesn't have to be in a context of enterprises. You just take this human behavior outside of corporate enterprise environment. How do you motivate and engage really has to take a huge consideration of how people respond to stories, how they resonate in their native language, their region, and so that needs to be pulled into the, the delivery of cybersecurity and education. Because if you're educating a group of people who are operating in a global organization, you have to look at that the one size does not fit all, and you can't just simply translate a single body of training into 35 different languages. And so that type of training needs to be tailored and focused from that specific group and then built around that as opposed to finding one center and then translating. And we can get to some examples because that's very interesting how that operates when you see it performing in a comp in the context of an actual real life environment. So, so may, may I take, uh, ask one thing here, Jonathan? So li listening to you, I, I, I hear that um, at least until some time, um, there was limited uh, security awareness uh, information or uh, uh, training avail available and uh, it was mainly in specific languages probably mainly in english or some other uh, like that um 
and and I see the cultural aspects was coming there as well. But uh, why why is that so limited? Do you see do you see that is is it because uh, and I'm leading here a bit, but still I uh, I would I would like to hear your opinion as well. Is it because of a uh, uh, how the enterprises behave, how the enterprises take uh, uh, importance of awareness, or uh, is there some other? Yeah. I, there's so much there to unpack when you think about why is that not something available. And let's take, for example, like Japan. Now, Japan is the third largest economy in the world. And when you think about cybersecurity, there is a lot of advancements and development in cybersecurity. And as you do in a lot of industrialized society, but at the same time, you also have a lot of vulnerabilities in general, just outside of Japan. And, and so, but when you focus in on a country like Japan to, to help answer this question, to kind of tease it out a little bit more, is you you find that there is a understanding that cybersecurity is infrastructure, it's technology, and it's the deployment and layering of all these tools. It is. There is that component. It's highly technical and it requires that kind of sophistication and understanding. Also, it requires training in individuals to understand what that whole entire deployment really means, not necessarily as a practitioner, but as an employee in an organization. What the basic fundamentals that you have to have to understand. And I think an analogy here serves very well. Think of it as the role of driver's education. You, you as a driver don't need to know the mechanics of how the vehicle technically operates, all the different components within the panel clusters, the engine. You don't need to have that knowledge and basic understanding, but when you're given the keys to the vehicle, 16 in the United States, 15 for driver's education, I think it's 20 in Japan, you, you have to have the basic rudimentary of safety procedures to be able to drive the vehicle because that vehicle is a, a 4,000 pound ton moving vehicle is a very large responsibility. Now that person who is now given the keys to the car doesn't have to have an understanding of all the mechanical technical components, but they definitely have to have an understanding of how to appreciate the safety features of the use of that vehicle. So I, I look at cybersecurity Awareness is very simple to, to that example, that everyday employees within an organization are like that driver who needs to have the basic understanding because their key is access to that network. And in the case of organization, in the case of driver's education, is that, that key is access to this large vehicle that is a dangerous weapon and can be a really impactful impact. It can have a very big impact on people, on a person's life. So that's the way I've approached cybersecurity to help break down the mythology around cybersecurity as a technical profession, but also to make it more appealable to everyday people within an organization. So, so that, that's how we've approached the cybersecurity story of how to make sure that when people are looking at cybersecurity within an organization, then you have to make it as, as a professional in that industry is how do you take a technical thing like cybersecurity and then make it applicable to everyday people's lives. And, and that's the, the language part of it is, is just another extension of that. If you're operating in Portugal, you want to be able to weave into that conversation stories that are going to resonate with the person who lives in Portugal and the understanding that that's a very different thing than Brazilian Portuguese from obviously South America. And the same thing goes with it if it's in English, you understand the nuances and there's going to be, of course, 50, 60 percent. These are just random numbers, not based on any kind of metrics, but I'm just saying there's going to be a good amount of it that could be applicable in any language. Some core fundamentals of safety and security might, might apply to every language, but there's going to be a good amount of it that's not going to be applicable. And that's the focus on where, where whereas practitioners, you have to really hone in on that area. And that's the difference between having one curriculum and making it available in 35 languages, but being able to truly localize through those 35 different countries or territories takes a lot of precision and understanding and conversations with that local community input and that constant iteration with that group. Because to truly appreciate the risks in that company, in that environment, you need to understand what are the things that's going to drive 
their behavior and, and also impact that behavior as well, positively or, or even negatively, because you need to be able to bring that out. Yeah, I really like that analogy of the driver's license and, and it rings painfully true, right? You you think, well, I mean, as a as a uh, unskilled driver, one may be able to to cause damage by, by running someone over. But if you think about what all is is connected, we've talked about this on, on the podcast just recently again about uh, operational technology, cyber physical systems being connected um, to the public Internet for, for automation, uh, for example. Um, if, if people have have no idea uh, what it takes to secure these uh, these um, yeah huge machineries and systems, um, the effects can be can be absolutely dire. So I, I think that's a that's a very good analogy there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Beyond beyond the localization issue, that that obviously is important. People need to understand um, what uh, what you're trying to to deliver as a message. I've, I would assume that uh, cybersecurity awareness also needs to take into account the the context or the day-to-day the -day work environment of of the you know employees, for example, of a, of a company. And what we've seen over the the last year is obviously a huge shift in you know IT environments and and security in general. Um, but I would guess uh, that also has an impact on on how you want to deliver. You know, security awareness trainings. What exactly you, you wanna wanna cover there, and and in your role at at Sal University, do you see a shift uh, in in companies' focus on you know what what to take care of and when it comes to security awareness trainings? Yeah, I we focus on Japan, and interestingly, Japan uh, big picture of cybersecurity awareness is at a stroke early maturation and there hasn't been too much conversation around cybersecurity. So what we're finding is we have to start at core fundamentals. And what I mean by that is we just have to spend a lot of time helping educate people within an organization why it's important to have educational awareness because there's been such a detachment with cybersecurity education as not necessarily part of cybersecurity that is just something good to have but not necessarily something that must be conducted and so i find ourselves continually talking with stakeholders within an organization and i'm speaking almost exclusively about japan because that that's where we're focusing all of our attention in this cybersecurity awareness journey and i think it's much more mature in the context of like the english-speaking world the united states maybe the uk and parts of europe and, and that's not necessarily to say that there isn't maturation in those jurisdictions, but because they've been doing this for many more years and there's a lot more players involved providing these services. And what I mean by that is a lot more investment money is going into cybersecurity education. There's a lot more conversations, thought leadership, discussions, publications in these countries. When you look at in the context of Japan, there's very little conversation around cybersecurity risk, specifically when it comes to the perspective of employees in an organization. And not, not training employees to be IT professionals, but training everyday employees and how they can become a fire, human firewall, so to speak, against all these different threats that may come up. So we find ourselves spending a lot of time in trying to communicate the right message to a Japanese audience and how we can weave into those messages stories that impact them every day within an organization. And that's going to be different from each industry, even different within different divisions within an organization. So we find ourselves spending a lot of time talking to members of an organization. Well, what, what are the things that they're seeing? What are the things? Because it's going to be very different from the IT department or from a technical field. They're going to say things that may actually resonate and be obvious for them, but it may not be obvious for, let's say, somebody in the marketing department. And, and so we want to be able to make that story very relevant and inclusive. And, and that, that takes a lot. And, and to do that in a short period of time, we don't, we don't want to have a lecture seminar style conversation. We want it to be very short and succinct with messaging that are very 
core focus with single topics as opposed to here's 20 things that you shouldn't do. We rather would take those 20 things and then make that into a series over the course of three, four months, and then reinforce that with questionnaires, quizzes, and a lot of conversation and different types of engagements within that delivery. And that's a constantly learning thing. It's hard because people try to push different modes of learning. You have people who are focused on gamification. How do you encourage and incentivize certain behavior within an organization? Is that the appropriate way to do it? Do you want to make it comical and funny? Some say, well, that's not really the style they want to have. They want it to be more serious. So does that fit? There's, there's people who, who approach cybersecurity when it's using comedy. Others use suspense and drama. Others use psychology and cognitive science. There's so many different approaches to doing it. And I don't think anyone is wrong, but what we try to do is weave into all of that, but from the perspective of a Japanese receiving this information. And that was what we thought to be missing in the Japanese context. And there is cybersecurity awareness being delivered in Japan, sure, no, no question about it. However, from our analysis of that, it, it, it's good that it's there, but it doesn't truly engage it professionally in a way where it takes that as a serious endeavor. It says, here's cybersecurity awareness, just kind of check the box and you're going to deliver it. And that should be sufficient for maybe a compliance perspective. That's fine. That at least is a first step in moving in the right direction. Now, there are some organizations in Japan that are truly embrace cybersecurity awareness, and a few of them. But again, as I mentioned at the outset of this conversation, Japan's the third largest economy in the world. And as a $5 trillion economy and the, the amount of assets that it holds and the political, intellectual property there needs to have just as much emphasis on human risk and how we can protect organizations. One, the visibility of all of their assets across the enterprise and how we're going to be able to protect that besides the technology is the humans that are there involved day to day that are interacting with the network that are interacting with the remote environments now given the situation in Japan, you have for the first time Japanese working in the remote settings and that's a, a fundamental shift from Japanese work where it's never been done before. And so with that comes with it a significant amount of risk that, that was already there prior to them moving into a home environment. But now I think that's magnified even more. So there's, there's a lot of that that goes into the thinking of how do you create content that resonates with these different audiences. And also in different age groups too. And you're talking a 22-year-old female versus let's say content that's gonna to resonate to a 65 year old male. So how do we make it so it's applicable in different contexts? And it's not easy to do. And I think it's constantly something we're working on refining. And, and I think with that, there's just very few people in the Japanese context doing that type of refining and constant refining of that delivery. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a learning thing. I think I'm, I'm the first one to say, I, I come at it from an entrepreneur's perspective and thinking this can be done better each week. We want to be delivering better content and how can we do it in a way that can allow people to really truly appreciate the cybersecurity risk aspect of their work. And so uh, that, that becomes a point of conversation with a group quite often. So that's that's quite a, a lot of things actually, Jonathan. So uh, I'm just uh, kind of picking up on what I thought uh, uh, key points one is, uh, of course, people, uh, companies, everyone focus on people, <laughs> the security aspect of that. Uh, and one size does not fit all. It's uh, really specific to different groups and uh, stuff like that, uh, culture, uh, everything. And uh, um, lecture style usually doesn't help. And and trust me, I have been through the experiments in my life throughout <laughs> being in industry from different companies on different ways of education. So in those lines, uh, I mean, it's, it's still very difficult, but uh, any one, two, three points that you would say is specific on that really, uh, you have seen that really hits the target or such thing does not exist. <laughs> so. I would say in the script writing of Japanese security awareness, whatever, you can substitute Japanese with Korean, Japanese with Italian security awareness. 
I would say when you're looking at that audience that you're trying to create impactful, meaningful security awareness, you want to integrate the people who are going to be involved in receiving the information to be part of that the creation. And that, that's, I think that's probably the main takeaway is the, and I think that's another, and I always like to operate using analogies like I did with the, the driver's analogy is, it's sort of like when you think about storytelling and when people are telling stories, they there's script writing or the writer's room, as they call it, and people that are involved in the storytelling and the craft of that. And, and if that writer's room is all one single type of person, let's say just you know, whatever that group may be, and it doesn't include individuals in the audience that you're trying to have that story resonate with, that's going to make the story less impactful. That's probably the best way to I'm trying to generalize, but can also be specific and, and without really, because it's hard to really say that there's one, two, or three different things that you can do and you can make it successful. It's, it's a constant dynamic process that we're finding, but the one consistency that we're, we're realizing is you want to include these voices in that script writing process is probably the best way to put it because you can we can do the legal the research involved to capture that information but telling that story is a little different and in, in, in doing that so yeah. that helps it's, it's, it's a hard thing to summarize because... <laughs> no no uh, that, that that's very good it shows uh, uh, that it's not as simple and it shows uh, that involve the people concerned i mean mm -hmm. completely agree yeah yeah, yeah. The people, the human element is is, is not an easy thing. And, and people, and I think cybersecurity and IT tends to not be the place often for that kind of creative storytelling. And, and a lot of times they're brilliantly smart, but that doesn't often translate to storytelling and capturing. And it reminds me of our engineering courses in college. You have these brilliant engineers. But it's sometimes very difficult to teach and they're hard and they know so much, but it's hard to tell that message to a general audience. And then that, that type of skill is very hard. And I think we struggle with that too, because we're trying to capture very technical things, right? Without, without taking away the depth of cybersecurity, because there's so much sophistication there, but making it available in another language that's resonating so that that person can appreciate and not feel like they're speaking, they've been spoken down to. That, that's a, that balance is very challenging, I think, and we can never appease all the different demographics. We always get typically from, from the IT side, oh, your, your content is so simplistic, it's, it's so basic. And I say, well, yeah, it is basic, but that's the point. It's basic, but it's something that's important The 99% of your organization doesn't have those fundamentals. And, and that that's the focus of what we're doing. We're not trying to get the people that are familiar with this to be trained, even though they should also be involved in that process, but it's that rest of the 99% of our organization that we're focusing on, that we're talking to, engaging with, that always look at us and think that we're an IT training company, but we're not an IT training company. If anything, we're more of a content business focusing on risk and digital transformation and engagement so um okay J jonathan thanks thanks so much for for summarizing this maybe rather than than focusing on, on specific aspects that you see as, as most impactful where do you see the industry as a whole moving towards and and mm -hmm. uh is that is that a positive outlook is that something where you would say okay there, there are certain pockets of of security awareness or certain industries that that don't consider this at all an important uh, issue at this point. Um, what's your What's your view of the the next I don't know three to five years? I, I'm positive. I think that the industry is moving to really understand the importance of both cybersecurity awareness, the human element in that, and are embracing the need to have that. Now we see constantly all these breaches and these headline stories, and then. Of course, a lot of the people in the profession, cybersecurity, talk about how we're not prepared or not. That may be true, but as people understand in cybersecurity, the, the cyber criminal side only has to 
get things right once. And on the side of the defense, you have to be able to be always right every time. And that's the challenge with cybersecurity, both in the technical and even awareness. You can have an organization where 99.9% .9 of the organization is very well trained and one person makes a mistake and then you make the headline as, as someone who failed at having the right controls. I think that that's great for, for the purpose of getting clicks if you're writing that story of the newspaper side, because people look and say, wow, people are not prepared. But I think the industry is really focused on developing the right controls, making sure that we have that communication, getting people to understand. And that includes both on the cybersecurity on infrastructure, the technology, and definitely the cybersecurity awareness side. Now, that's the industry. Now, specifically to Japan, I think optimistically as well, there's not as many people involved in cybersecurity awareness. There's probably maybe two or three, I may be wrong, but I don't think there's that many organizations focusing on enhancing, expanding cybersecurity education. And that is how we looked at the opportunity. As an organization, as an entrepreneur, I was looking and thinking, where would we be able to provide the most value in a society? In the case of Japan, we found that the biggest gaps was education for all of 126 million Japanese. How do we provide content to make available directly to everyday families and members of the society at large, and then also an organization? So we've always measured where the industry is going and what we're doing to advance that mission. Are we getting our content in front of as many people as we can? And I believe we are in the case of Japan. And so I'm very optimistic with Japan for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of conversations about cybersecurity among the popular press, among everyday people. Maybe it might not be as much as we think it should. However, it's much more than it was two or three years ago. There's a lot of focus among large Japanese blue chip companies and even downstream, people are talking about it. You can watch shows and segments on NHK and they're talking in mainstream about cybersecurity. And that's, for me, positive, even though there's still a lot that needs to be done in, let's say, cybersecurity insurance. There's still a lot that needs to be done in expanding the availability of content and making people more aware of the importance of it. There's still so much more that needs to be done. I think the, the maturation, I can use the word maturation because in the U.S. you have cybersecurity awareness to the maturity of that has advanced a little more. In Japan, it's just starting to develop and us, probably just a few of us you know, on the side of building this kind of library of content is sort of in the, the forefront of doing this. And so we're seeing large amounts of interest in this you know, across lots of different sectors. So that's positive. You know? And I feel like it's going to continue. It's going to take, ooh, someone put a number to it, I have no idea, five, six years to, to really get that kind of interest. But, but that's it's happening quickly. There's a lot of people making making the right type of things happen. So, so, so a lot of things. To, All right. Slow moving, unfortunately. But. <laughs> Definitely, lots of lots of work ahead. I think we we do agree with with that sentiment. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, I think you're you're doing some some great work. Definitely uh, helping the the broader market to to understand the risk and and meet those challenges uh, a little bit better prepared. Um, and with that, I think we are going to conclude our our podcast for today. Thank you again for joining me, and uh, thank you all to our to our listeners. And talk to you in the next one.